Okay, so welcome along, ladies and gentlemen, to your weekly SETI seminar series. Today we're, uh, we're very lucky to be joined by Oliver White, who's come across to us from Texas, where he works at the Lunar and Planetary Institute currently. Uh, Oliver did his master's and his PhD at the University College London um, in planetary science. His PhD topic was uh, on the influence of environmental conditions on volcanic processes in the terrestrial planets. Uh, and then in 2010, he moved across to LPI to work with Paul Schenk, uh, and he's been working on topography of uh, Io and uh, other Saturnian and Saturnian satellites. Uh, he's interested in uh, these topics for uh, looking at the topography of craters and identifying crater relaxation, and as I'm sure we're going to hear about uh, in his talk today, and uh, what that can tell us about heat flow conditions on these icy satellites. He's also uh, published on uh, topography of Mars and Venus using uh, altimetry from uh, radar uh, and also visible images. Uh, and he's uh, published uh, papers on uh, looking at Martium Vallis uh, on Mars as well. But uh, today he's going to talk to us about topics further out in the solar system. So please join me in welcoming Oliver. <coughs> Okay, thank you, Adrian. Yes, so I'm going to be talking to you today about one aspect of the work that I've been doing with uh, Paul Schenk at LPI, uh, specifically uh, using Voyager and Galileo imagery to create the first ever global DEM, or at least as close to global as we can get of uh, Io, um, Jupiter's uh, volcanic moon. And as we'll see, uh, doing this is uh, much easier said than done. So understand Io is something of an esoteric subject a lot of you might not be familiar with, so I'm going to start with a brief introduction, just introducing Io's geology. Um, I'm then going to talk a bit about uh, previous research that has gone into trying uh, to discern uh, Io's topography on both uh, global and local scales. Uh, then I'll talk about the mapping that we've been done, uh, the various techniques we've used, and uh, try and talk about um, the various ways in which we try to overcome a lot of some of the uh, uh, problems that are very frequent uh, with respect to uh, these mapping techniques on IO. Um, then I'll present the global DEM itself and uh, sort of show how it compares to other uh, topographic data sets and finish up with some uh, highlights of the DEM that I've selected. So IO, it's the innermost Galilean moon and the fourth largest moon in the solar system. Here's a comparison with uh, Earth and the moon. It's just a little bit larger than Earth's moon. It's special because it has over 400 active volcanoes on its surface, making it the most volcanically active object in the solar system. All this volcanic activity really um, stems from uh, orbital dynamics of the uh, Galilean satellite system. Io is in a 2-1 uh, resonance with uh, Europa and a 4-1 resonance with Ganymede. And so this regular um, sort of pulling and pushing of Io's shape between uh, Ganymede, Europa, and Jupiter basically causes it to stretch back and forth and uh, results in dissipation of tidal heating in its interior, where, which is the source for this uh, great volcanic activity. Io is um, a something of an anomaly amongst our solar system satellites. It's the only one that doesn't feature any ice on its surface. It's uh, believed to be composed of a silicate rock surrounding a molten iron core. And perhaps the, mo the most recent, one of the most recent developments in uh, d trying to discern Io's interior is this study of, uh, by, led by Karana et al. from 2011, which uh, posits this uh, global, possible global subsurface magma layer that may be feeding uh, Io's volcanism. So the vast majority of uh, Io's volcanic centers are in, t in the form of pateri, uh, these sort of caldera-type structures, um, which have uh, flat floors bounded by steep walls and uh, not very, very little obvious uh, positive relief. Uh, what stands really out amongst all these pateri is uh, Loki Patera. It has a diameter of 200 kilometers, by far the largest uh, patera on Io, with an active lava lake that doesn't really change much between Voyager and Galileo observations, and thought to have an episodically overturning crust. It's really the powerhouse of Io. It accounts for between 10 and 25 percent of its total thermal emission, and you can apparently observe it quite easily uh, from infrared observations from Earth. Aside from the Pateri, um, uh, volcanic centers are, the, the other real sort of type of volcanic center is in the form of uh, 
uh, roughly symmetrical um, shield volcanoes, such as seen here, which uh, show some element of uh, significant po positive uh, relief. So a consequence of having all these uh, volcanoes on the surface of Io, um, which are active uh, for really quite, quite a lot of their, quite a lot of the time during their existence, is that um, Io's surface is uh, resurfaced very, fre uh, very frequently, and as a, as a result, Io has pretty much the, young has the youngest uh, surface of any body we know of in the solar system. One way it resurfaces through uh, plumes, such as uh, this uh, plume coming from Tvajtar Pateri that was caught by uh, New Horizons as it passed on its way to Pluto in 2007. Uh, these coat uh, Io's planes with uh, sulfur and sulfur dioxide frost, perhaps best shown um, with a uh, Pele here with its uh, associated halo. Uh, in addition to uh, getting coated with plume deposits, we also see a lot of uh, what appear to be dark sort of silicate uh, lava flows on the surface of Io. These can reach uh, thousands of kilometers squared in area and have been seen to move several kilometers over a matter of years. And uh, so Io, as a result of all this resurfing, has a very young surface. Um, not a single impact crater of any size has ever been spotted. Um, this uh, is actually a uh, correlation of map units from David Williams' uh, geological map he made of Io back in 2011. It had pretty much the oldest uh, surface he could um, discern based on uh, sort of stratigraphy was uh, millions, of, millions of years. So Io, the most of Io is uh, pretty flat, but it does have some uh, very high relief features in the form of uh, more than 135 mountains. Current thinking is that these probably form through subsidence-driven compression as uh, you get the um, sort of plume deposits landing on the surface and uh, building up through over time. They tend to be sort of several kilometers high, but the highest of all is uh, about, about 18 or so kilometers high. They have two sort of distinct morphologies, flat top maesters and uh, tilted crustal blocks, and they often tend to be bounded by uh, steep scarps. And the other form of a uh, positive uh, relief feature is uh, our layered planes. These are sort of flat, these are flat topped uh, plateaus, generally relief of several hundred meters. And they often show scalloped margins and this, uh, and sort of this fractured appearance. And they've been attributed to erosion of crustal layers. So that's sort of just a brief introduction to uh, Io's geology. So what um, has been done previously on uh, sort of trying to discern Io's topography and uh, what really can we learn from knowing Io's topography? So um, throughout both the Voyager and the uh, Galileo era, um, a variety of methods have been used to try and um, discern Io's uh, global shape. <coughs> and it was realized since Io is so volcanically active that um, it's possible, it may be possible to relate the global scale topography of Io to a non-uniform heat flow transported uh, to the base of the lithosphere. Uh, the study of Robert Gaskell in 1988, in the simplest scenario, uh, the higher heat flow you have, um, that, yeah, if you have a raised heat flow, you'll uh, convert basal lithosphere to low-density asthenosphere, and you'll get um, isostatic, uh, isostatic uplift. You get a higher topography in that location. So if we can, perhaps if we can uh, sort of gauge global uh, low amplitude topography on Io, we may be able, we may be able to um, find out the source of tidally forced heating in its interior. Uh, this figure is taken from Tackley's 2001 study on uh, modeling convection within Io. He shows uh, two end member scenarios. Um, in the left, -hand, uh, the left hand scenario, all of Io's heating is concentrated in the mantle, and it shows the distribution of uh, heat flow at the surface. Uh, on the right hand, um, all the uh, heating is concentrated in the uh, asthenosphere. So yes, by knowing um, yeah, Io's long, long wavelength topography, you may be able to get some idea of uh, its uh, internal heating. And perhaps this can be also be compared with a study like uh, Karana's um, uh, study of, uh, trying, of uh, discerning the, this uh, layer of global melting uh, several tens of kilometers below the surface. Uh, the first study to um, really look at, to try and gauge uh, Saturn's Long, wave, long, long wavelength topography was that of Robert Gaskell in 1988. He mapped uh, large swells and basins on the surface using Voyager control points and uh, created this hist the first histogram of uh, Io's global topography. 
Um, from this, he found that uh, there wasn't really much deviation of more than plus or minus one kilometer over um, the tracks or figure that he determined uh, using control points. He claimed to identify um, a longitudinal arrangement of uh, swells and basins at 90 degree spacing, but uh, the uncertainties associated with these more than half their amplitudes. And uh, he finished by um, interpreting these swells and basins to be suggestive of an asthenospheric tidal dissipation model. Uh, ten years later, Peter Thomas um, uh, used uh, a different method to gauge Io's global shape and uh, try and define its long wave, <laughs> long wave length topography. This is using 18 Galileo limb profiles. So on the left, you can see the, the ground tracks of all these profiles. On the right, you can see four examples of, uh, of the profiles. So in each of these cases, the uh, zero elevation it's basically the elevation is defined by the uh, tracks or figure that uh, Peter Thomas defined using the uh, limb profiles. And the associated topography is represented by the residual between the profile and this uh, zero uh, line. So uh, Thomas's study concurred somewhat with uh, Gaskell's in that um, little long wavelength topography more than a kilometer in amplitude was identified. But there were still high associated uncertainties, and he couldn't really confirm these swells and basins. And he finished up his topography section by sort of leaving, I guess, what could be regarded as a challenge. He recommended further topographic analysis to reduce uncertainty in relative topography over most of Io to less than 300 meters. So with these uh, shoulders of giants to stand on, as it were, what will a global digital, digital elevation model of Io bring to the table? Well, it's a global uh, DEM will reveal, it will reveal topographic variations that aren't apparent in imagery and limb profiles, and which uh, now we have uh, Dave Williams' geological map of Io can be correlated uh, with uh, geological units. But the really th important thing about having a global DEM is that these previous uh, studies, um, the, the uh, data set is not continuous um, with limb profiles and control points. Uh, you can only really get topography um, at certain select locations on the surface. Uh, with a continuous data set um, should hopefully allow us to allow to um, uh, sort of define more precisely uh, long, long wavelength variations. Um, on a little more local scale, uh, Paul Schenk, my uh, boss at LPI, has been uh, pretty strongly involved in uh, using stereo and photochromatry analysis over the last 15 years or so to, um, basic, to get uh, topography for um, localized specific uh, topographic features. Um, he's uh, put a few studies out on uh, uh, shield volcano morphologies um, with which he's uh, managed to determine that uh, they're amongst the lowest, uh, height, have amongst the lowest heights of shield volcanoes in the solar system. And he's inferred a few properties of them from that. Um, he's also uh, brought out a few studies focusing on mountain height measurements that have uh, allowed us to, allowed some, to given us some idea of uh, the process of mountain formation on Io and uh, the nature of their collapse. Um, this is Eubea Mons here, which has on its north flank uh, under the mouse arrow, one of the biggest landslides seen in the solar system. So how will a, um, D, how will a global DEM help us with uh, localized topography? Um, it should, uh, yeah, a, generating a global DEM will cover all possible geologic features on Io. These previous studies have been somewhat uh, localized and uh, sort of, um, yeah, localized in their extent. Um, there are people who are certainly interested in getting better um, characterization of Pateri top topography, such as uh, Ashley Davies at uh, JPL, um, allow us to estimate missing material volumes, and also can um, allow us with, uh, through determining war slopes, um, to give us a better idea of uh, lith lithospheric strength via. Um, and also uh, improving our characterization of mountain morphologies uh, means that we can uh, refine conditions that control mountain formation on the Io and gives a better idea of the compressive stress, straight, stress state of the lithosphere. So at LPI, um, we've used uh, four methods to, uh, to contribute to our global DM, and these have been uh, refined by Paul over the, uh, over the last uh, few decades. He's um, created specific uh, ISIS, ISIS derived software to LPI um, to, uh, to implement each of them. I'm going to start with limb profiles um, because uh, these become relevant um, with respect to later um, techniques. Um, and for each of these techniques, I'm going to discuss uh, how they work 
then discuss uh, problems, IO-related uh, problems associated with them, and how we've tried to overcome them to uh, kind of distill the best uh, data we can out of what's available. So limb profiles are really the only topographic ground data we have for IO. As I've mentioned before in describing the Thomas study, they're defined as the residual between the limb profiles and the triaxial ellipsoid fit. Uh, this figure shows two examples of uh, topography being apparent on uh, limb profiles. On the left, we had a Voyager image with uh, mountains uh, poking up um, with the against, with, uh, contrasted with the blackness of space behind. On the right, we have a Galileo image where these mountains are silhouetted against the bright uh, sphere of uh, Io behind it. Uh, yes, what well, did I say, Saturn? Uh, I get, yeah, I do Saturn and Jupiter. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is an example of um, what one of these uh, limb profiles looks like, and uh, there are various caveats associated with it. So limb profile is shown beneath with its uh, ground track on the surface, shown as the uh, red line above here. So one of the, um, yes, uh, unfortunately, the limb profiles do show their own associated noise, uh, which reach amplitudes of sort of several hundred meters over lateral distances of, about, of tens of kilometers. Um, another peculiarity of limb profiles is that um, you can often get uh, off-limb corruption in them. That is, if you imagine the uh, limb of Io and you have a mountain um, that's actually uh, a mountain that appears to be on that limb, um, you can, in some cases, get mountains that are actually lo their location is slightly behind or in front of the limb. So while the limb seems to be showing a mountain is there um, on the actual limb itself, there will be uh, there is no such mountain. Um, and uh, in order to identify off-limb topography, you kind of have to go over um, all these ground tracks with a fine tooth comb to sort of identify uh, really where the ground track seems to be, um, uh, seems to be corresponding to a uh, high relief feature in the visible data. And uh, Dave Williams' geological map has also proven useful, useful for this. And a good example is here, Towhill Mons. The uh, red ground track, it, um, Toho Mons is actually, you can see just to the side of the uh, limb here, where the red, as indicated by the red ground track. Um, another, another, um, yeah, another sort of, another um, aspect of uh, errors in limb topography is that uh, Pateri, such as Micabo Patera here, will be hidden. The uh, negative topography uh, is not really generally, of neg negative topography for um, small, uh, Patera-like features are generally not uh, apparent in limb data. And uh, they can also be subject limb profiles to uh, compression artifacts, some of which uh, may, be, may be apparent in uh, some of the limbs I'll show later on. So um, in order to correct for uh, the, limb the noise in the limb profiles, I've uh, applied a smoothing filter to them, um, the effects of which are shown in uh, this uh, limb profile here, basically to try and just, uh, yeah, get basically to get rid of this uh, short wavelength high amplitude noise. Um, noise levels can differ quite significantly between different uh, profiles. And this one, it's actually, the noise is actually pretty uh, low level. But in this other, in this other one, um, which is actually at the same scale, plus eight to minus eight kilometers elevation and 6,000 kilometers long, you can see that the uh, noise is at a much higher level, probably two to three kilometers as opposed to one or so in the uh, previous profile. Okay, so now we we'll move on to uh, the um, some of the techniques that involve uh, ISIS uh, ISIS um, processing, and the first of these is stereophotogrammetry. So um, what you need for stereophotogrammetry is uh, a left and a right-looking image of a patch of terrain on Io, uh, preferably of comparable um, of com comparable resolution. What uh, Paul's program does is that in one of these images, in this case the left one, for each pixel in the image, it defines uh, a box around uh, that, that pixel that's centered on it, and um, it's possible to define how big this box is. It then goes to the uh, other image, the right-hand one, and, uh, in, in that, in the say in, and it tries to find the uh, corresponding pixel um, uh, using a pattern recognition algorithm within that same box. So here we can see for uh, Busoli Montes, a pixel at the summit here. On the right-hand one, uh, it found that this uh, same pix this uh, location corresponding to this pixel has uh, moved slightly to the left. From this, it can determine uh, parallax and uh, associated uh, topography. 
problems, uh, IO-centric problems associated with stereo. Um, unfortunately, uh, there's frequent, um, there's a lot of noise associated with the stereo DMs on IO, due to because uh, a lot of IO is composed of fairly featureless uh, planes, low contrast planes. Um, so basically, the uh, stereo program can't really lock on to um, it can't really lock on to uh, corresponding pixels between the two stereo images. Also, um, one way in uh, which I can uh, scupper efforts is that uh, between uh, stereo, left and right stereo images being taken, you can get volcanic activity, which can, of course, uh, confuse the program when you have a lava flow appearing where one wasn't before. Um, and also, Galileo images in particular can be um, sort of can be um, uh, yeah can be affected by radiation noise quite a bit. So in general, stereo DEMs, they are reliable at long wavelength regional scales, but can't really resolve fine scale topographic features. Uh, for ver res vertical resolutions of regional stereo DEMs tend to achieve a few hundred meters. So this is, um, we're talking lateral resolutions of um, sort of a, a, few to, a few kilometers or so. So I did basically some experimentation in Paul's uh, stereo technique to try and minimize noise where we could. And I did this by, uh, by experimenting with the box size um, that the stereo program uses. And I found that um, if I use uh, larger box sizes, then it tends to reduce the um, severity of the noise. The, um, the, it, it certainly, you, get, um, you don't get quite as much uh, high amplitude uh, noise across a shorter a lateral uh, distance as you do using a smaller box size. <coughs> Uh, so you basically, it can reduce, uh, in, in areas where once you did have quite a lot of noise, it can reduce the severity of noise in those areas, and it can also produce a smoother DEM. So this is shown in this sequence of four images here. On the left, we have the original right-hand stereo image. In this one here, I've used a box size of 31 by 31 pixels, and here a box size of 15 by 15 pixels. And uh, this area under the mouse here, which corresponds to this area of sort of uh, low contrast planes over here. Over here, the um, noise is quite apparent. This uh, sort of white and sort of white, sort of small localized white and dark patches. These, these will be sort of like go from plus 10 to sort of minus 10 kilometers. In the 31 by 31 box size, this, um, these <coughs> the uh, area covered by these noise patches is uh, somewhat reduced. However, um, a, a higher box size isn't always uh, <coughs> necessarily, y y it, it's mostly useful for uh, reducing noise in plains areas, but it's uh, not so useful for um, high relief uh, areas such as mountains, such as this uh, north spur of Busoli Montes down here. So basically with high relief, high relief terrain then tends to show less noise um, because it generally shows more <coughs> contrast than the plains do, and it has more associated parallax. <coughs> So basically, I um, uh, sort of settled into this routine where for a particular stereo pair, I look and see where we have smooth plains areas and where we have high relief, uh, high relief mountainous areas. For the uh, low relief areas, I'll uh, process it using a higher box size. For the, um, for the high relief areas, I'll process it using a smaller box size. And then I'll merge the two, so it kind of gives us uh, the best of both worlds. We get smooth. Uh, a smooth and sort of re noise reduced um, a DM for the plains areas, but for the uh, high, rele high relief areas, um, we get some of the fine detail coming out that's a result from using a smaller box size. <coughs> so, and finally, if we have any remaining noise, we can mask that using an automatic, uh, automatically or manually. And um, one thing to notice is that even if the uh, DM has been smoothed, you can still get some sort of terracing effects uh, where you get sort of sort of differences in elevation of about a kilometer between these uh, different uh, between these uh, different uh, elevation contours. So ideally, we apply a smoothing filter to the uh, final product. So if we produce a stereo DM that we're pretty happy with um, with respect to noise levels, this DM now exists kind of in its own reference frame. And if we want to incorporate it into the global DM, we first have to fit it uh, by controlling it using uh, any available limb profiles. So, and the process of this is shown here. So we have our um, right-hand stereo image here. We have the uncontrolled DEM in the middle. And on the right, we have uh, the limb profile topography, in this case, two limbs that uh, overlap with the uncontrolled DEM. 
what we do is we uh, create a, uh, a, um, t a d an elevation difference map by subtracting the uncontrolled DEM from the limb topography to produce uh, the elevation difference map here. Then um, the uh, control program can define a plane of elevation difference based on uh, the uh, elevation difference map in the previous slide. And this plane of elevation difference is added to the uncontrolled DEM here to produce a controlled DEM. So if we go back, we have a ra patera here. In the initial uncontrolled DEM, the sort of the uh, the DEM was mostly it was pretty uh, sort of pretty flat across its extent. But with the controlled DEM, it's uh, found that um, there's actually something of a gradient um, sort of going to the north here. So basically. If in order to do this, first of all, you need to, of course, um, eliminate any off-limb topography from the limb profiles. You don't want to con uh, control your uh, stereo DEM using mountains where there aren't any mountains. And of course, if you have more coincident limb profiles, it will yield a better controlled uh, DEM. You need, an actual, you need a minimum of two limb profiles, and um, it tends to be at the poles where you get um, you get uh, better control because uh, a lot of the limb profiles are north-south uh, oriented, so there's a lot of overlap uh, at the poles. Now, if it turns out for a DEM with there aren't any coincident uh, limb profiles, then we have to kind of control it uh, second-hand by um, controlling it using any underlying controlled DEMs. It's uh, unfortunate we have to resort to that, but in some cases we do. So that's basically how I've uh, modified uh, Paul's original stereo technique. Um, now, when it comes to uh, photochromatry, there's quite a, another range of uh, hurdles to overcome. So photochromatry is also referred to as uh, shape from shading. Uh, how photochromatry works is that in an uh, ideal situation, uh, you start with a, uh, a low sun angle image, such as one shown here, close to the terminator. And ideally, you also need um, a an image of this particular patch of terrain at a high sun angle, uh, such as in the uh, cent central image here. So what a low sun angle image will do is it will throw uh, topographic features into sharp relief, whereas for the uh, high, al high sun angle albedo image, uh, the effect of relief will be diminished, and instead the albedo of the surface will be um, accentuated. So how photochromatry works is that uh, the albedo image is uh, reprojected to the same lighting conditions as the original low sun angle image. Uh, the program then goes through every pixel and compares the shading in them. And from that, it can determine slope. And from that, create uh, a photochromatry DEM, as shown on the right here. Now, one thing that's necessary for successful photochromatry is an accurate model of the photometric function, essentially the something that defines the uh, sort of intrinsic albedo of the surface. And for IO, this has been approximated in Alfred McEwen's study by the lunar Lambert function, known as L. But unfortunately, uh, there isn't really a global photometric model of IO that exists on the kilometer scale. And IO is um, special in that it has a very variable um, albedo across its surface, much more so than a lot of the icy satellites in the outer solar system. Uh, now, Paul Schenk has um, basically gone about for a number of his uh, sort of um, a number of his um, shield volcano studies has estimated photometric parameters as a function of phase angle, as shown in this graph here. And if you do if you do manage to have an albedo um, image um, to do to do photo photochromatry with, it does reduce reduce a lot of the error in uh, in in uh, it does reduce a lot of the error associated with the technique, but um, quite often photochromatry uh, DMs will still show quite a bit of uh, topographic undulation over, over, large, over um, long wavelength uh, distances. So primarily, it's useful for mapping local scale topography. So in that sense, it's kind of the opposite of stereo, uh, stereo DMs. So if we want to do photochromatry successfully on IO, um, it turns out that actually, in quite a few instances, we don't have an albedo image, and this is relevant particularly at the poles, where um, you'll get you often you'll get a lot of uh, low sun angle images. But given they're at the poles, you won't get any instances where the sun angle will be high. So I've gone back to uh, experimenting um, with what happens when you just have a single uh, low sun angle image to do photochromatry with, and I've um, experimented with uh, using two variables, basically uh, the uh, parameter, the value used for 
the photometric function itself, L. And also, um, I've experimented with cropping an image around a particular <coughs> landform of interest that we want to get um, an, a DEM for. Uh, and this reduces um, basically the albedo variation as, as opposed to whether if you were doing it um, across the entire image. And uh, to, in order to independently verify uh, our photochromatry measurements, I've used, uh, I've used uh, shadow measurements. So in this case here, these are two DEMs I've made, one that includes the entire scene for this uh, area near the South Pole, and one that's cropped around in site of interest, Echo Mensa. And in each case, um, I've indicated the location of a shadow measurement on uh, Echo Mensa's scarp with this uh, X here. And so these are the uh, results of my uh, experimentation here. So first thing to point out is that the shadow measurement uh, yielded a, um, an elevation of about one kilometer for the uh, scarp height of uh, Echo Mensa. But given the resolution of um, the image, uh, it has quite high associated error bars, plus or minus 0.125 kilometers. And uh, the red and blue um, data points are for the cropped scene versus the entire scene. And the point, the really the important point to get here is that when you, uh, when you uh, create a DEM using the entire scene, it, uh, the resulting scarp height is uh, significantly lower than that of the shadow measurement. Whereas the, when you crop the scene and reduce the variability in albedo across the scene, the uh, scarp height comes out as being quite similar to um, the shadow measurement. Um, the bottom axis is the uh, variations of the photometric function. Um, the, even f varying from very low to high extreme for the photometric function doesn't uh, affect the <coughs> resulting scarp height as much as uh, varying the uh, cropping of the scene does. Um, in fact, the, uh, the um, best match is for an extremely high photometric function of 1.2, which I'm not sure I quite believe. But um, given that the, uh, all of these values for the crop scene fall within the error bars, really the important um, thing to uh, glean is that really, if you want to do successful photochromatry on IO, you really have to, um, it's a bit more time consuming, but you should really um, uh, crop your images around landforms of interest. So ultimately, once we've made a photochromatry DEM, we can, if we have a uh, coincident stereo, stereo DEM, we can merge the two. And that essentially gives you the best of both worlds by combining long and short wavelength components. Uh, so shadow lengths, um, I've sort of briefly mentioned that in the photochromatry section. Um, shadow lengths is kind of sort of intermittently useful for uh, IO, um, they're restricted, of course, to the near terminator coverage where sun angles are low and last long shadows are cast. Um, they can only provide relative elevations for individual high relief topographic features, which on IO is generally, uh, high, generally mountains. Um, yes, and in some cases, we can also get uh, measurements for pateri depths in uh, some high resolution images. OK, so that basically gives an idea of the sort of the various techniques that we use to uh, measure topography on IO and how I've, uh, t how I've tinkered with them to try and extract um, the best data we can of, out of uh, uh, a, a planetary body that is very difficult to do this for. So this image summarizes um, both um, all the locations of the uh, limb, limb profiles that I've used to control stereo. These have been graciously provided by Peter Thomas. And we have 25 limb profiles and 21 ground tracks in, in uh, the black here. Underneath, we have a map that shows the uh, stereo coverage of IO. Note that the uh, unit I've used here is theoretical stereo DM resolution. So basically, what that means, that what that's referring to is the resolution, the lateral resolution of the lowest uh, resolution uh, image in each stereo pair. Um, that's, so basically, yes, the initial, it's the resolution of the initial DEM you create before you do processing with uh, things like smoothing and stuff. And so this, um, after almost three years, is uh, what I've uh, ended, up, ended up with. So this is the global stereo DEM. I haven't um, included any uh, photochromatry component uh, in this. The entire DEM has a mean elevation of about uh, of uh, 0.11 kilometers, a uh, standard deviation of plus or minus uh, about 0.9 kilometers. But um, interestingly, once we um, take away the uh, 
um, mountainous terrain more than two kilometers in elevation to basically just uh, leave us with the long wavelength topography. We have something a quite reassuring elevation of 0, 0.00 kilometers. So that means the um, mean elevation of the DEM corresponds with the uh, sort of datum level as defined by the uh, limb profiles. Uh, the, the standard deviation for the long wavelength um, component, though, is uh, plus or minus 0 0.61 kilometers. So about 68% of the uh, DEM we have is uh, about 68% um, is within plus or minus uh, 0.6 kilometers, which um, is probably maybe a little bit more variation than uh, Robert Gaskell and Peter Thomas got in uh, their studies. Um, for comparison, this is the global uh, limb topography. Um, I haven't actually, I haven't managed to um, uh, purge it of the uh, of off limb topography, but I have presented um, sort of uh, mean and standard deviation values uh, for the global limb topography minus uh, minus the off limb component. So um, yes, uh, there are a few instances here where this off limb stuff is corresponding to these uh, bright albedo features, which are con considered to be mountains here. So at this point, it was um, a good idea to um, assess the reliability of the global DM that I've made. How well does it agree with the limb profiles that we use to con control it? So this map you see here is a map of elevation residual. Um, it's basically the, uh, the um, topography in the limb profiles um, subtracting the uh, DEM topography. And I found that the mean residual is, uh, the mean absolute residual is uh, 0.61 kilometers with about half of um, all the data points uh, being less, the residual is less than half a kilometer in magnitude, but about 20% uh, the residual is more than one kilometer in magnitude. So 0.6 kilometers can seem like quite a big difference between um, sort of the limb topography and the uh, DEM. It's perhaps not surprising given the uh, nature of the uh, contr of the stereo controlling process and the sort of resolutions of the data we're seeing here. And the, uh, the residuals are not distributed uh, evenly. Around the, uh, 180 degrees here, we see uh, residuals that are pretty low at around zero degrees. And this makes sense because uh, these limb profiles show quite low noise levels and they also correspond to the location of a stereo DEM that is pretty high resolution and which uh, has given us uh, some pretty good, uh, pretty good data. There are some instances uh, where there are really quite sustained high residuals um, in the elevation residual map. One of these is located at uh, Mycenae Regio in the uh, southern hemisphere. Uh, this, um, you can see here, the uh, DM in green uh, r remains at about zero uh, kilometers elevation. But in the limb profile, there's a, um, there's a broad uh, depression here that's a couple of kilometers um, below datum. And this, this feature was actually called out by Peter Thomas in his 1998 study. Um, he, and he attributed it then to sort of the high noise that's apparent in this particular limb profile. Um, also, Peter Thomas noted this, this other profile out uh, towards the west. Uh, he noted it because it's it, it's interesting in that it shows a very um, high topography difference between the northern hemisphere and the southern. Uh, in the northern hemisphere up here, it's about two kilometers above datum. Down here, it gets to about uh, two kilometers below datum. And as you can see again, the uh, our DEM is generally at about zero kilometers elevation. So you're going to get uh, low residuals down here and high residuals up here. So these. So in instances where we get high residuals, it seems to be because the limb topography is being extreme, whereas our DEM is sort of hovering about zero, um, about, about zero kilometers elevation. This kind of makes sense because um, if you imagine the limb, the controlling process, if you control your DEM with multiple uh, limb profiles, and the majority of the topography in the, those limb profiles is of fairly moderate elevation, but you get one instance where you have extreme elevation, the final controlled stereo DEM will reflect the majority of the uh, topography in that, but not the um, extreme component. So that's why really the, a, lot of our, a lot of the DEMs come out being uh, zero kilometers and, uh, and, and doesn't really reflect these occasional extreme, um, extreme uh, sort of long wavelength elevations that we get in the limb profiles. 
as to what causes these extreme uh, sort of these um, sort of patches of sustained extreme elevations in the limb, profile, limb profiles. I'm not sure at the moment, um, particularly since um, in quite a few cases they, the extreme topography is not reflected in adjacent profiles, such as here and here, and uh, between the extreme topography here and in this one over here. So um, it may be due to compression artifacts in the data for that particular limb profile. So in the last week, and for the purpose of this presentation, um, I drew a bunch of uh, latitudinal profiles um, across 360 degrees. Um, so at, uh, at zero degrees, and then plus or minus 25, and plus or minus 50, just to see um, what really came out. And um, in black here, um, I have the, uh, so, so the, the stereo DM. Um, but I did apply a smoothing filter to each of these profiles to try and uh, resolve um, any sort of, uh, try and better resolve any long wavelength uh, topogra topographic features coming out. Uh, the colors refer to the uh, resolution of the original DMs that uh, contribute um, to the global DM. So one thing to notice is that uh, DMs have pretty good resolution, such as this blue one here. The uh, data is pretty continuous, um, so there hasn't been really much noise here that's been masked. In a sort of, in a, DMs with worse resolution, you'll know that notice there's like these or this orange one, there's quite a few data dropouts where a lot of noise has been masked. So really just glancing at these profiles, um, I, what, what caught my eye was that there is a possible configuration of basins and swells uh, between 90, degree, 90 degrees west and 360 degrees west and zero to 50 degrees latitude. Um, I guess when I, um, one sort of uh, one, one reason to think these may be genuine is that then don't occur in just a single, uh, over a single uh, stereo D. They don't occur in parts of the global DM that were made with just a single stereo DM. Uh, this, this configuration is shared between various uh, stereo DMs. These basins and swells aren't really, however, the same as those mapped by uh, Robert Gaskell in 1988. And it should be noted that this pattern does break down somewhat in the uh, southern hemisphere, perhaps due to a uh, um, inferior data as well as other topographic features getting in the way. The amplitude is uh, plus or minus is uh, only about uh, one to two kilometers for these uh, basins and swells. And what I'm going to do um, in the coming months is to assess as whether this uh, falls into uh, uncertainty levels. So that's um, pretty much that's uh, sort of the global DM in a nutshell. Um, got a bit of time left just to um, go through some of the highlights of the uh, global DM. This is going to be, I've only assembled these slides uh, pretty recently, so this is going to be kind of descriptive more than analytical, but um, they're just bringing up some things that really caught my eye. One of the most characteristic of these is this uh, depression, this very uh, this deep depression about uh, reaches about two kilometers uh, below the uh, surrounding terrain in the uh, southern hemisphere and it reaches about uh, 1,000 uh, kilometers across. So we have uh, two, pro I've taken two profiles across it, A, B, and C, D, which are shown here. So the uh, depression is here and here in each case. I've also shown it alongside the uh, global, the, uh, the, same, uh, the same part of the geological map of Dave Williams from 2011 to see uh, what geological units he maps correspond to this uh, big depression. I think this d depression is probably um, genuine um, because it all falls within uh, a single stereo pair of good resolution, one and a half kilometers per pixel. Um, as in the uh, geological map, it corresponds pretty well to a unit of undivided flow material as mapped by Dave Williams. But of course, this isn't the only place on Io where such uh, units outcrop. So at the moment, I'm um, perhaps being a bit speculative, but wondering what uh, if maybe these uh, flows happen to uh, um, sort of take advantage of uh, this topographic low. Um, maybe they originated from one of the uh, calderas uh, sort of adjacent to this depression. Or maybe these flows are originating from a vent at the bottom of this depression that's uh, now buried by the flows. At the moment, I don't know, but it's something I'm interested in focusing on. Another thing I'd like to focus on in future is this uh, strange what I've called this high relief arc uh, that's just to the uh, south of the um, this big depression. Uh, generally, high relief topography on IO does not really uh, arrange itself into noticeable uh, 
sort of regional or global scale patterns, but this is a notable exception. This arc um, extends for about 2,200 kilometers uh, long, sort of seen in purple here, and uh, it curves uh, quite sharply at its end. And it incorporates um, two types of units as mapped by uh, Dave Williams, uh, specifically mountains and layered plains. And what interested me about the uh, mountains, they display sort of a, a quite, in quite a few images, a sort of lineated fabric that just sort of runs parallel to this arc. Now, this made me think uh, maybe, if, maybe if there's um, perhaps the formation of these mountains is perhaps somewhat related by a sort of regional compression regime. I'm not necessarily arguing uh, for plate tectonics on Io, but uh, at the present, mountains on Io are thought to form through uh, sort of uh, stresses in the crust associated with a uh, sort of burial of um, plains deposits. So maybe potentially um, sort of a regional stress regime set up by that could, be could have been responsible for formation of both um, uh, sort of the various mountains uh, within this arc. But it's also remembering that this arc shape uh, originates not just from constructional topography like the mountains, but also erosional topography. Um, the, uh, th so the, uh, the layered plains in between um, are essentially erosional remnants of uh, previous plains that uh, would have uh, connected the mountains. So again, it's something of an enigmatic feature, and Dave Williams was certainly interested in this when he saw it at uh, LPSC earlier this year. But uh, yeah, something I'd like to focus on at some point. Um, Loki Patera is obviously a feature of interest, considering it's uh, the most massive Patera on uh, Io. It was covered by um, da uh, stereo data of two and a half kilometers per pixel, so sort of moderate to not so great. Um, and there was quite a bit of noise to uh, cut out here. But um, generally from these profiles, it achieves uh, a depth of about two kilometers below the surrounding terrain. It's worth noting that um, the, this area of low topography doesn't, uh, isn't really bounded by the uh, boundaries of Loki Patera as seen in the visible data, but rather the, it extends across a slightly broader region that encompasses Loki Patera. Also noticeable, that, um, notable is that this central island uh, is unresolvable in the DEM using our, um, in, yeah, in our DEM. Um, so yes, if we were to do a uh, sort of missing volume, um, uh, missing volume calculation for Loki Patera, it would correspond to about 43,000 kilometers cubed for the low albedo Patera floor area. Pele is an um, interesting uh, part, interesting subject on Io, given that it was seen to uh, sporadically erupt a plume over both the Voyager and Galileo missions, creating this uh, characteristic um, uh, sort of halo uh, structure here. Um, unfortunately, it was covered by some of our rubbish, r most, uh, yeah, cruddiest stereo data of three and a half kilometers per pixel. And it also kind of um, scuppers itself, Pele, because a lot of these, a lot of the halo part is, uh, shows very low contrast that uh, the stereo program can't get a fix on. So in fact, it's only really get a fix on the central part of Pele, which in the stereo data seems to actually rise about 2.3 kilometers above the surrounding halo. This is a zoom in of the uh, Pele's center. Uh, the plume has been seen to originate from this uh, lava lake uh, here. Um, the uh, la the uh, zone of high topography corresponds pretty well to the lava lake itself and not uh, actually Danube Planum, um, which is a outcrop of mountainous material just to the south. Um, that maybe makes me wonder as to whether um, this is the fact that Danube Planum doesn't really show up, whereas uh, sort of the, the uh, center of the Pele, center of Pele does. It makes me wonder as, um, as to whether um, this, this, we've got some sort of maybe noise that hasn't been uh, eradicated creeping into this uh, area. Um, I would have sort of expected a bigger signature for, for Danube Planum. But um, anyway, that's essentially what we have through lots of uh, refinement of uh, Pele's stereo DEM. Uh, Tafajtar Pateri, I'll go a bit quicker now since we're getting near the end. Tafajtar Pateri was that one I showed you earlier that had the uh, New Horizons, saw the plume coming out of as it flew past in 2007. Tafajtar Pateri was fortunate in that it uh, has some of the best resolution stereo data we have for any Patera complex on IO of uh, 0.3 kilometers per pixel. 
And uh, the tiered structure of this complex comes out pretty well in the DM, despite noisy, noisy areas where you get very little contrast in the planes here. Um, basically, what I did here is I created a quick and dirty geomorphological map of, uh, of, the, of the complex. And the colors here along this profile, AB, correspond to the uh, colors in the profile here. So the, it seemed to resolve pretty well this massif that's located to the west of the uh, Patera complex. Um, the floor is sort of shown here. There is quite a bit of a variation. But um, if you do, I've done a lot of um, profiles across here to get uh, mean elevations for each of these various units. The small caldera comes out pretty well as well. Um, I'll show a couple of mountain uh, the results of mountains in the stereo DMs. Mountains are generally pretty well covered um, in stereo DMs because they have quite high albedo contrast. Uh, they, they're high relief features. And they also show quite high parallax. Uh, in general, I haven't really seen any flexural troughs surrounding the mountains. Um, maybe that, p p perhaps because there aren't any, or maybe our vertical resolution is not quite sufficient. Uh, this is Busoli Montes, one of the mountains of the uh, sort of, of the um, uh, of the uh, tilted block variety. You can see it um, in this, two, uh, this AB profile across here. Um, it shows that it uh, sustains a slope of about 38 degrees across a lateral distance of 10 kilometers. So this must be, therefore, one of the most colossal cliffs in the solar system, whereas the north flank has a mean, of, uh, mean slope of just uh, 9 degrees. Uh, Towhill Mons was part of that uh, high relief arc I showed you earlier, and it's covered by a lot of really excellent stereo uh, topography ranging from about 200 to 1.5 uh, kilometers per pixel. And uh, various DMs resolve this uh, interesting summit, amph what appears to be sort of a summit amphitheater complex pretty well. In the black uh, profile here, it's uh, at this point. In the red one, it's at this point. In the green one, it's at this point. So again, kind of uh, descriptive here, but sort of just showing you sort of the capabilities of global DM. Um, with regards to uh, photochrometry, I've sort of only fairly recently sort of, um, sort of, sort of gotten, um, sort of settled into a, the photochrometry routine that I've described earlier, that I described earlier. So I don't have that many to show you, but I'm um, going to show you at least these two, um, uh, both in the uh, South Pole. And I should note that these are actually, these are places where the PC uh, DM has been merged uh, with uh, coincident stereo DMs. So we'll revisit Echo Mensa, um, which I showed you in the sort of uh, technique, uh, in the technique refinement section earlier. And remember, they had, we had this shadow measurement here. So this profile taken uh, from AB shows that there's actually what appears to be a little bit of up warp in the center of uh, Echo Mensa. And I showed this visible image here. It kind of makes sense, because you can see the shading on the right here is a little bit brighter than on the left, which suggests that indeed uh, the center of Echomensa is upwalked a little. Also, um, in this image, we also get um, these uh, smaller fragmented um, uh, layered planes to the northeast, displaying a, relief, displaying a relief of about 500 kilometers. Sorry, 0.5 kilometers. And uh, one other interesting thing to note is that uh, Echomensa shows these uh, sort of fractures uh, on its surface that suggest it's maybe in the process of eroding, and uh, maybe it will end up eventually um, uh, as these uh, fra sort of fractured layered planes as seen down here. Uh, nearby, um, a few hundred kilometers away from Echo Mensa is a uh, Hiroko Patera. Uh, this is another um, PC uh, stereo combined DM here. Despite some undulation in the uh, this DM, um, walls show relief about, about 1.2 kilometers on both sides. Uh, I've taken another shadow measurement here at the X, which reveals about uh, 1.36 kilometers of relief, so comparable to the DEM and, and certainly within the uh, error bars of the uh, shadow measurement. Um, it should be noted that the, the error here, 0.332 kilometers on the shadow, is higher than that of uh, Echo Mensa because the uh, solar instance angle is higher here, and therefore your shadow extends across a shorter distance. So, OK, just to summarize um, this, this IO venture, stereo and photochromatry topography mapping is probably the mo more difficult for IO than any other uh, sort of outer solar system body. And uh, I've spent um, 
Yes, and, but experimentation has um, yielded useful results. I think we have um, managed to uh, limit, as probably best we'll ever be able to, uh, noise associated with uh, various techniques. Um, I've used 70 stereo DEMs. Uh, I've mosaiced them to create a global DEM that, creates 70, that covers 75% of IO's surface. It adds a new data set to the previous global shape studies and extends high resolution, the, the high-resolution stereo investigations of uh, Paul Schenk. It hints at possible global scale longitud longitudinal undulations in the northern hemisphere and has allowed uh, characterization of uh, morphologies of, uh, several, of a few dozen mountains and some pateri. Uh, photocometry is, uh, the stereo element is pretty much done. Photocometry is somewhat ongoing and uh, will eventually be applied to individual landforms, um, but uh, it's generally not going to be applied to uh, entire regions. And so stuff that uh, remains for me to do is uh, trying, to, trying to assess um, sort of whether these undulations seen in the global DM are um, genuine or not, whether they fall in within um, uncertainty limits as defined by errors, um, uh, quantitative errors um, that we in associated with the stereo process itself, as well as um, looking at uh, sort of residuals between the DM and the limb profile. And um, also be interesting to uh, compare um, our DEM to maps of volcano and mountain distribution to search for any uh, potential correlations there. And um, also perhaps to, as I showed you with the, TAC, the figure from Tackley, the Tackley study early on to try and identify any uh, global scale convection driven patterns. So that's pretty much the end. And I guess after all this, uh, all this time uh, working with a like Galileo and uh, Voyager imaging, it would be pretty pleased my heart nothing more than to have all of this made redundant by uh, what I've dreamt up as the IO orbiting laser altimeter to uh, give us a nice uh, molar type um, global DEM. But um, unless we encase in, in our spacecraft in lead, uh, that's probably it's not going to be coming anytime soon. So thank you for listening. That was yeah, quite, quite, in, quite a lot, uh, probably unfamiliar material in quite a short time, but uh, yeah, thank you, and we have to take any questions. Uh, so Oliver, I'll, uh, I'll bring the, the, okay. uh, the uh, mic around. Um, uh, so uh, have you got any indications at this stage of, uh, of uh, long wavelength uh, topography around the planet that, you, that you're able to, to speak about? or? Um, is that process just ongoing? Um, it is sort of on, it is kind of ongoing. I mean, what I showed you is, I mean, the, that uh, the uh, diagram with the five um, longitudinal, the five latitudinal profiles along 360 degrees, uh, I, pretty much, I pretty much made that last week, and that's pretty much the extent of my analysis so far. A lot of what I've been doing is uh, sort of mapping out residuals and, and stuff. Um, so. Yes, pretty much that and the sort of highlights I um, included is pretty much the extent so far. It is an ongoing process, yeah. Oliver, uh, you did show some examples of where uh, people have modeled where the heat distribution may be coming from the asthenosphere versus the mantle and so on. Yeah. Uh, do you see any correlation at this time between uh, where you're seeing mountains or large regional depressions or any of those things which suggest that one of those two models, or some other model you didn't show us might be more relevant than the other. OK, so let's uh, run back. So all right, this was, this is the, um, this was the, these were the two end member states, so all mantle, all asthenosphere. Certainly the, so far, I mean, yes, I w in future I will do um, longitudinal global profiles. So far I've just done the latitudinal ones. Potentially, um, I mean, certainly the all asthenosphere version um, we see more of a longitudinal uh, variation uh, than we do latitudinal, and um, that, and so, yes, that's, I mean, and we see sort of a, we see it at a scale that is comparable to what I've gleaned so far from my map, sort of like a 180 degree sort of scale. Um, it's also worth mentioning that um, Karana's uh, study also um, uh, it also um, deduces a zo the zone of melting in a more of an asthenospheric location than deep mantle, so sort of 30 to 50 kilometers. So at the moment, I would probably say it 
just on what I've seen so far, it may be um, moving a bit more towards an asthenia sphere. Right, for instance, the other thing you can see, uh, if you sort of ignore the longitudinal variations, is that the mantle uh, diagram suggests that most of the heating will be near the poles. And yes. The Mm -hmm. And we don't really see a high sort of density of volcanoes at the poles. Yeah. Thanks. Mm. Yeah. Um, related question. The data you've got mm -hmm. seems to suggest that there's some interior structure here. Uh, does this rule in or rule out a completely liquid mantle? At present, um, at present, I'm not quite uh, sure whether if I have, can answer that, especially um, confidently. Um, yes, I mean, uh, probably I, I would say that at the moment I it can't really um, can't really uh, confirm liquid mantle or not. I mean, if if we um, have an if if the data I have sort of at the moment I'm thinking may sort of point towards an asthenospheric. Um, uh, heating model, then it would be more in line, it would be in line with the Karana's um, uh, deduction of a, sort of a 50 kilometer thick um, zone of what a glo basically a global magma ocean at 50 kilometers uh, depth, um, 30 to 50 kilometers depth, 50 kilometers thick. Um, his model has, uh, I think, more of a, a solid, uh, I think a solid mantle. Um, or let's see, yeah, maybe partial melt. Uh, mantle below that. Um, so yes, uh, I probably wouldn't want to say too much else about at the mo that at the moment. Yep. Hi. Yes. Um, given how you know many lava flows and how much geological activity is on Io, oh. if you manage to get your wonderful lead-lined satellite, yes. at, at what resolution would you have to keep changing, uh, keep taking more measurements because the topography was actually changing in a visible way? Um, probably on the sort of tens, several meters to tens of meters. Um, some of the, yeah, some of the, I mean, we do actually have a few, I haven't included them here, but uh, Paul has um, um, done stereo on a few extremely high, um, so we're talking lateral resolution of sort of a few tens of meters that he's got some of his, uh, made some deductions regarding sort of lava flow thicknesses and viscosity before. Yes. Um, Definitely, you'd want to get down to uh, sort of a few sort of tens of meters resolution. But even if the topography does change, I mean, it's still, it, I mean, it's ongoing, and it gives us just an idea of sort of how volcanism functions. I mean, if you if you have one volcano that's sort of covered by a lava flow, there'll still be sort of other. It's there'll still be ongoing volcanism <laughs> um, to get data from. So it doesn't necessarily matter if sort of sort of. Yes, features you're interested in are covered up. There'd be pretty much be others, other features that are um, will arrive before long. Yeah. Uh, if you have enough data over time, say from the Galileo mission in particular, uh, could you actually generate a digital movie of the uh, surface activity of Io and uh, maybe even uh, show exaggerate the elevations uh, that you have uh, over time? And show how the uh, the moon is deforming under the tidal forces. So sort of I like mean, I think that would be a quite a dramatic uh, demonstration. That would be that would be very neat. So, like, sort of come back in a hundred years with sort of some more, <laughs> some know, more, and sort of see. I hope not. <laughs> although you sort of mean in like, or you sort of mean sort of like a sort of like a continuous mission, just yeah, yeah. I mean, you can make data. a time lapse movie. Certainly, of you know, moving up and down and blowing up. Yes, at that extent. No, that would be really kind of cool. Yes, yeah. um, that potentially yes, you may be able to. You may you might. Probably, I think the um, Io is. I think it's stretch. It's stretching um, by the tidal forces is known to create tides of like sort of at least certainly tens of meters, um, sort of a day. So like, yeah. So you would yeah you need that sort of resolution over a if sort of like a mission lasting years. You could probably certainly there are certainly specific lava flows like um, Prometheus um, was seen to erupt a lava flow sort of over tens of kilometers over. Um, a num over a number of years, um, certainly yes. If you could have a time lapse for that, with the uh, sort of with um, data, sort of achieving again like tens of sort of tens of meters 
res resolution, um, then yes, I don't see why you couldn't uh, have a model um, that sort of shows, um, yeah, the very. You try to gather all of the photographic information mm -hmm. on iOS you can get, uh, and just sort of develop a methodology to uh, get to an, a, a time-lapse animation with the moon, and then uh, use that to, and then refine that over time as you know, more data comes in. Yes, that would be very okay. useful. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, so the question is about uh, registration of the stereo DMs to the okay. limbs. Uh, certainly the limbs are not exactly the altitude profiles that you observe. Uh, they are, you infer the, the, the altitude profiles from these limbs. And when you do the matching between the stereo DMs or the photoclinometry uh, to these limbs, uh, are you considering to adjust both the limbs, the profile of the limbs, based on the stereo DMs or, you know, the, the photo? Um, at the moment... Because right now you, you're basically just adjusting everything to the limbs. That's true. Um, at the moment it is, it is essentially one way at the moment, yes. Um, really all I've done, been able to do with the limbs is, uh, um, is uh, just smooth them. There are, however, um, yes, certainly the limb profiles are not all equal and there are quite a few instances where I've seen I might potentially go back and um, sort of eliminate some parts of the limbs that I'm uh, concerned maybe. They don't show any obvious off-limb topography, but they still show some uh, peculiarities, like what I showed in a couple of instances that Peter Thomas also noted. Particularly, um, certainly you'll probably get quite a few errors in the limb topography as you approach the poles, uh, where the, uh, sh the, uh, the lighting is at a low angle, and so you'll get less contrast between the uh, limb itself and the blackness of space behind. I've noticed in a couple of limbs, you, there seem to be a lot, quite a bit of a sort of un, un, yeah, pro unlikely ver sort of topographic variation there um, that uh, yeah, should ideally be probably ex sort of got rid of before. Um, Yes, uh, yeah. Yes, that's right, yep. So what software did you use for, uh, for photoclinometry? Um, it's, uh, it works on, on ISIS, uh, on, on Uni Unix machines, yep. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, Oliver, I have a um, <laughs> special setting mug here Paper for you. Um, I've noticed um, <laughs> that if you uh, put it in this orientation, it doesn't look entirely dissimilar to a uh, Tavishtar or uh, some similar volcanoes. Yes. You could well, use it in your uh, simulation. Well, Patera means saucer. In yeah, oh, yes. Yep, so, yeah. Yes, so indeed. I guess it's probably this type. Please, yep. please join me in thanking Oliver for his great talk. Thank you.